<clears throat> Mark five twenty one. All three synoptic gospels have this this uh, incident recorded. I believe there's something maybe the Lord would want us to get out of it today. Mark 5, 21, And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. Behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. When he saw him, he fell at his feet. And besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him. Much people followed him, and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. What faith. Straightway, and straightway, or immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? They kind of thought that was a, a really, how in the world are we supposed to know with all these people right around you? But Jesus knows when you touch him, doesn't he? Amen. <laughs> Verse 32, and he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Father, we thank you this morning again for your word. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to touch our hearts this morning with this passage of Scripture. Help us, Father, to glean from it this morning what you would have for us. The spiritual gold that's in this portion of thy word, we pray that thou would help us to mine it this morning. Quicken us this morning and illuminate our minds and open our ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to us today. And Father, for all that you do, we'll give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. This lady, we don't even know her name. We do not have any record of her lineage. We don't know where she came from. We don't know where she went after this encounter with Jesus. But what we do know about the story ought to thrill our hearts. This lady had been battling with a physical infirmity. The Bible tells us for 12 long years. That's a long time. This particular type of infirmity created a stigma for her. And not just a stigma, it created a prohibition. Do you know that as long as this woman had this problem, she was not allowed to go to church? She was not allowed to enter the temple? This lady was not allowed to touch other people. There wouldn't be another rabbi in the town. If they were Orthodox Jews, would want her anywhere near them. This woman was ceremonially unclean because of her affliction. 
can find that in Leviticus chapter 15, I believe it is. You'll find the prohibitions for that type of thing. But this dear lady had been isolated from her church. She had been isolated, no doubt, from much of her family, much social intercourse. She was not allowed to mix and mingle. And there you find her uh, situation quite desperate. Not only was she restricted in the fact that she could not intermingle with other people, she could not go to the house of God, but friends, she had gone to physician after physician after physician. Until the Bible tells us, I think it's in Luke, that she had spent everything she had trying to effect a cure. And you know, if the situation's desperate enough, we'll do that. If the need is great enough in our life, we'll literally bankrupt ourselves trying to get that need met. We will. But this lady, bless her heart, she had been in that situation for a long time. The Bible gives us the amount of time, the 12 years that she had lingered in that situation. She had went from one physician to another hoping that this one would have the answer, only to find that he didn't know what was wrong. And go to another one until she had exhausted the physicians and she had completely exhausted her bank account. She was desperate. She was needy. She was in a plight, friend, much like we are as sinners this morning. We are destitute of any means to help ourselves. We have tried this self-help program and we've tried that self-help program and we have made resolution after resolution to do better and only to find that our life is just one continuous merry-go-round of defeat. But the scripture says here that she heard about Jesus. She had suffered things of many physicians and nothing better. When she had heard of Jesus, he wasn't, he wasn't advertised as a doctor or a physician, but he was known to be a healer, wasn't he? You know, Jesus still heals when he chooses to do so. I would that we had the faith to believe more I believe we'd see more, don't you, if we had the faith to believe more. In the institution of divine healing, I believe that Jesus still has the power to heal sick bodies. I believe he has the power to heal cancer, AIDS, arthritis, you name it. Just go right down the list of those hundreds and hundreds of diseases that mankind has racked up over the centuries. And you'll find there's not one that Jesus can't cure. Amen. You know, as wonderful as that is, and as great as that is, uh, I'm glad this morning that though you have gone and you've committed most every sin in the catalog of sin, you've ran through every mud hole that's out there, you've, uh, you've been uh, involved in maybe much of what the world calls dark, deep sin, but you know, there's not a sin so dark or there's not a stain so deep that the wonderful Jesus can't bring and wash us clean. Come now, let us reason together, Isaiah said, though your sins be as scarlet, and some of you have on scarlet this morning. My wife said something, I didn't get the memo about Valentine's Day this week. I don't have, I don't have my Valentine's cover. That's probably not the reason you wore it. But you know, red kind of stands out, and, and it's all right. I don't, I'm not opposed to red at all. Uh, just, just making an observation. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be whiter than snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You know, that's the power of Jesus Christ this morning. That's the power of our God. But this dear lady was afflicted. She was, she was pressed down. She was no doubt depressed and I don't know if she was living in pain with her infirmity, but whatever went along with it, there was a lot of problems and there was a deep, deep desire to get better. And you know, that's where it all begins at is a desire to get better. <laughs> a desire to get free. A desire to be delivered from the bondage of sin or even the affliction that you might have. And friend, our desire plays a big part in getting our prayers answered. He said, whatsoever you desire when you pray, believe that you will receive it. 
Friend, if you don't care whether that prayer gets answered or not, Jesus is not going to answer it. <laughs> or if you go to prayer just half-heartedly asking for this, that, and the other and a whole list of things, and you don't really have that fervent desire to see that done, those prayers don't go very far, I don't think. But if we have a fervent desire, if we have an intense desire, whether it's spawn of a need or whether it's spawned of a, of a pain or affliction, friend, that drives us in desperation to God. That drives us with an urgency to God. That drives us with a deep desire. Lord, I need this. This is not just a want. Lord, I need this. And this lady was at that point in her life, I believe, that she was willing, number one, friend, to, to put herself in a position that legally, under church law, she was not allowed to do. That's why she just wanted to kind of cower away once she had touched the hem of his garment. She wasn't going to stand up and say, hey, the Lord heal me. She wasn't about to do that because she knew there were people in that crowd that would haul her off. And who knows what the punishment under that law was, whether she would be beaten or whether what, whatever the case may have been ha happening. She was, she was actually breaking the religious law of that day by being in the crowd. And then to reach out, and that's probably the reason why, friend, she chose his garment and not touching Jesus' person is because she realized in her condition she was not allowed to do that. You know, this affliction had caused her many, many restrictions in her life. And sin puts many, many restrictions in our life. And the heartache and the guilt that we suffer and the relationships that are broken and the things that happen because of sin it creates a lot of restrictions in our life. And this lady was bound by restrictions. She was bound by this, this code that says if you have this condition, you cannot be in public. You cannot touch other people. You're unclean. What an awful stigma, wasn't it? Isn't that an awful stigma to live with for 12 long years? And maybe she was a devout... I believe she was probably a devout lady. I believe she probably wanted to be in church those 12 years. I believe she wanted to have fellowship with her family and church family during that time. But she had something that kind of hindered that, friend. And sin does that in our lives every day. It interrupts families. It interrupts marriages. It interrupts children uh, between themselves. It interrupts a whole lot of relationships every day. But I'm so glad that she heard of Jesus. I'm so glad that she heard of the name of Jesus and it doesn't seem to have taken her long to make up her mind if there is someone anywhere that can do anything about my condition, I'm going. Boy, if sinners get that hungry, if people in our community get that awakened to their spiritual need, when the church doors open, they will be here. And they will be looking to touch Jesus and have Jesus touch them. Friend, and that's what we need in this hour is an intense hunger for God, an intense desire to live for God and be what God wants us to be and not be content to be under those awful stigmas and reproaches of sin that this lady was under because of her infirmity. It says here that she came in the press behind. Now, I don't know. I kind of picture her once she gets within close range of Jesus that she probably dropped to her knees. That would be my thought. It doesn't say so in the scripture, but it said uh, she had to get down pretty low to reach the hem of his garment because it was down to the ground. It was down to the feet. The garments that they wore in those days, the robes that they wore were down very low. They were very modest. And so she had to get down very low Maybe she didn't. Maybe she was very agile. Maybe she could bend very well. I don't know. But whatever the case may be, when she got close enough to Jesus, friend, she reaches down and she makes a, an effort, trying to do it nonchalantly, I, I'm sure, so that others won't begin to wonder what she's doing. But as she reaches down and she gets down to the, the border of his garment, the hem of his garment at the bottom, and she, she touches it, and the Bible says immediately. 
Immediately this thing stopped. Immediately she knew within her own self that she was whole. You know, touching Jesus is a wonderful experience that you can know for yourself that you have touched him and he has touched you. And you can come into his presence and know that the work is done. Isn't that a wonderful thing this morning? I remember B.J. Walker. I'm sure many of you have heard him preach a lot. Old B.J. is a prince of preachers. He said, friend, if you could, if you could be saved and not know it, that you had it, you could lose it and not know you lost it. You know, that would be a sad thing. If we could have it and not know we had it, then we could lose it and not know we lost it. But friend, you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus has touched your life if you will come in faith and humility and, and, and with a fervent desire to be whole of your condition, Jesus will meet that need. Yes, he will. Just like he did this precious lady right here. It said the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. He said, well, did she do it without Jesus' permission? Did she steal this healing? Did she go up there and rob God of a blessing and him not even know it? Cast aside such foolishness. Cast aside such foolishness. He knew she was coming before she ever came. So why did he ask? Same reason he asked Adam where he was in the garden. It's testimony time. It's confession time. It was a rhetorical question. Jesus knew who touched him. Virtue does not go out of him without his blessing and permission, friend. We're never going to steal it from God. You're never going to be able to get it without God's approval. And so Christ was here, and he knew that virtue had gone out of him immediately. He knew it just as immediately she knew it, because there was something that took place that transferred from him to her. Get it, friend. Get this picture. There is something that transfers from him to you as you pray and touch Jesus. Amen. There is something of his virtue, whether it is in healing virtue or whether it is saving virtue, it is all the same. Something must transfer from him to you. And when he quickens you with his spirit and he touches you, friend, it's just like this lady's physical infirmity. She knew in a moment's time it was done. She knew the work was done. She knew she was better. And friend, when Jesus touches you, you'll know you're better. You'll know the load of sin is gone. You'll know the guilt is gone. Amen. It passes from death unto life. You can't pass from death unto life and not know it. And so thank God this morning, something happened. She touched him and he touched her. Which was the greatest touch? His touch. The garment didn't mean anything. Virtue wasn't in the garment. Her faith, I don't think, was in the garment, or I don't think she would have gotten what she got. Her faith was, this is the only part about him I can touch legally, and maybe not even that, but I'm going to go this far to touch him. I'm going to go this far to try to touch him so that he can touch me, and he did. Praise God this morning. There is a wonderful touch the Lord wants to give every one of us. There is faith that reaches out and touches God through whatever means, through whatever avenue God is wanting to work in your life. Faith is the key, friend. Faith is the key. Believe He's able to do it. Do whatever it takes to be desperate about it, to get in His presence to touch Him. He's not walking the streets of Boiling Springs this morning physically. But He is. He is walking house to house, heart to heart. And friend, you can touch him. He's passing by this moment. The song said, your need to supply. You know, Jesus is ever present, looking and longing and waiting and seeking the lost sheep that have gone astray. He is looking for those ones. He is looking for those that are desperate. He's looking for those that are tired of the bondage that they've been in for so long. And friend, most people don't even realize they're in bondage today. But Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? He made it clear. 
There wasn't any question about where she touched him. She touched his garment, just like she said. And his disciples said to him, Seest thou the multitude thronging thee? And you ask us, who touched you? Jesus said, he looked around, about, and who did his gaze fall upon? The exact right person, wasn't it? His eyes searching the group around him until his eyes and her eyes met. And friend, it was immediate. But the woman, she was still fearful and trembling, but she knew what was done in her, and she came down and fell down before him and told him all the truth. Lord, this is what it was. This is where I was at. This is what was wrong with me. And I've tried all of this, Lord. And I've, I've tried every doctor in town. And I've tried every remedy that people told me about. And how many of us have done that in trying to get some kind of cure? Everybody's got a cure, you know. And so we want to try it. If it worked for them, it might work for us. But it doesn't usually work. <laughs> And so we go around and around and around and around. But Jesus is a cure that works. Jesus is a power that can meet your need this morning. He can meet your need, regardless of what it is. And uh, she came and fell down and told him all the truth. And she confessed out that her problem had been this. And she had dealt with it for all these years. And she told him all about the situation. And he didn't rebuke her, did he? He didn't send her away scolded. He didn't send her away hurt and damaged. He said, no. He said, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Your faith in me has cured you of this incurable disease. I say, hallelujah. Your faith, my faith, friend, if it's in Jesus this morning, can do the miraculous today. Still yet today. Because he's not changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He said, go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Most scholars interpret that to not only be a physical healing, but a spiritual reaction as well that took place in her heart. Go in peace. There is no peace, my God saith to the wicked, so, friend, something must have happened to her, not only in the physical, not only in her physical body. Something glorious happened to her, but in her spiritual life, something else happened to her. She went away in peace, friend. Not only not hurting, not only not embarrassed, not only not under the shame and ridicule of that stigma, but she came away with Jesus in her heart. I believe that with all my soul. He said, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Jesus still wants to meet the cry and the need of hungry, desperate hearts. Again, friend, if it doesn't matter to you whether he does it, then it won't happen. It takes a measure of desperation. It takes a measure of conviction from the Lord. It takes a measure of determination on our part. But, friend, it takes the grace of God. You have to touch him. You have to come his way, humbly, bowing before him, acknowledging the need. He wasn't going to let this lady get by without bringing glory to God. He wasn't going to let her slip away in the crowd and rejoice privately about the wonderful, matchless grace of Jesus that had just done a miracle in her life. No, he was going to have her praise God in the multitude of people for what Jesus had just done for her. There's a plug for testimonies. You know, Jesus wants us to bring glory to God. And what he does, he does to bring glory to the Father. And so Jesus healed this lady. And I believe he saved this lady. And brought her to a place where not only was she able to go back to church. Not only was she able to go to town and shop and whatever ladies did in town in those days. <laughs> I can't imagine there were thrift stores, but there might have been. You know, I, I, just, I just believe that her life was totally changed that day. Amen. And I just believe this morning that if you'll touch Jesus, your life will be totally changed. Amen. And not for the worse, my dear friend, but for the better. Amen. Oh, preacher, I can't live that way. I can't do. I can't, I can't. No, you can't, but he can if you'll let him touch you. 
It is Christ in you that's the hope of glory. The kingdom of God is within you when you get saved. Friend, it's God working through us to perform His will. It's not us this morning. Oh, we're rejoicing on this way. I'm glad for this old-fashioned way myself. I rejoice in it. I don't want to live any other way. A friend of mine early on, he was a Sunday school superintendent. He said, uh, of course, like I told you in Sunday school, I testified to everything the Lord dealt with me about. <laughs> I went to church and testified about it. We had a bunch of jewelry. I'd paid for wedding bands with little diamond chips in them. I had a nice big class ring on my finger from high school. And uh, I don't know what else my wife might have had in the line of jewelry at that time. don't remember now. But we got rid of it. And we testified to it. He said, put off the wearing of gold and pearls and costly array. And, and, and we just took it at face value. We just testified to that and just, just went on. And, you know, it was, it was a wonderful thing not to be cross-grained with the Scripture. It's a wonderful thing to not have any, any condemnation when I read that part of the Scripture. That, well, I just said, Lord, I, just whatever you want. Whatever you want, Lord. I'll get rid of it. We'll do this. We'll, we'll just go this way. And I rejoice in it. And never look back, friends. Never have the desire to have it again. I'm just very happy and content living without it. Why, preacher? Because Jesus put something better than gold and silver in my heart. And he wants to put that in your heart so that you can say, Lord, I'll live the way you want me to live. I'll be the way you want me to be. I'll serve you, Lord. I will. I'll serve you with my whole heart. And the touch of Jesus will make all the difference because he takes the desire for a lot of things out of our heart. And we don't miss them. We don't want them anymore. We don't need them. We don't want them. We're happy. We're contented in his presence and in his blessing. That is the greatest desire the Christian have is to please the Lord and let him bless our hearts. Amen. And this woman was very content to go on with her life and go on serving God. And I believe she was probably a strong uh, proponent for Jesus. But she did it by faith. She touched him. And when her faith touched him, his power touched her. And she was a changed individual. Friend, it still happens today. It still happens today. And touching Jesus is all that really matters. You can make friends of a lot of people in high places. You can do whatever this world thinks to run, uh, climb the ladder of success. But I am of the solid opinion today that touching Jesus is all that really matters. If you haven't touched him this morning, the ladies are going to sing for us. Touching Jesus this morning. The Lord speaks to your heart. The altar's open. If you need to touch him, if you need his touch, let the Lord help you this morning, would you? They're going to sing an old song, but it's a good song. And ask the Lord, Lord, I want to please you. I want to touch you. You mind the Lord as they sing. Thank you.